So this is part two of uh, the introduction to machine learning with the scikit-learn. So last time, if you've watched the video, we've talked about what's machine learning, the different categories, uh, supervised and unsupervised stuff, and what's scikit-learn. It's probably the most popular uh, machine learning uh, library out there. And um, talked about data representation. Um, so I'll just very quickly go over the basic workflow because we're going to do some uh, examples, just a reminder of the workflow. Then we'll do some uh, few examples of how to train a model. And then just general remarks on uh, model validation improvement. Now, there's other topics one can do if there's interest in the future. We can do uh, feature engineering. Uh, that's another topic. We can also go through uh, specific models, just discuss maybe a little bit of the math uh, behind them. Uh, that depends on uh, if there is demand for any of this stuff. But uh, the main emphasis here is on just showing the practical workflow of uh, running, uh, uh, training a model, and not so much about going into the details uh, of this or that model. Uh, OK, so this stuff, we covered it last time. Um, these are the different uh, models. If you go to the scikit-learn page, so you have the supervised stuff, classification or regression, and unsupervised is uh, dimensional reduction or clustering. There's this other few other topics. I'll talk a bit about this topic here, model selection, which is related to uh, model evaluation, improvement, all that stuff. This one we didn't uh, talk about. Uh, we might, it, it touches a bit on uh, feature engineering in the sense that you have to clean up your set and all that stuff, but uh, you will see depending on demand. Uh, okay, so as we said very quickly, if you're going to do uh, anything with scikit-learn, it expects your data to be broken into a feature matrix. That's your input. That's n samples. The sample, every sample is a point, is a data point, and it has uh, n features. That's basically the properties that you decided to include. And then you've got the labels, which is your uh, target uh, vector. Now, of course, if you're doing unsupervised learning, then you don't care about the labels. It's just basically uh, because uns unsupervised learning is just you feed it feature matrix. It's not really doing, uh, predicting something and checking against some answers. That would be supervised learning. So it just needs a feature in this case. OK, so uh, now back to the basic workflow, because we're going to use it in the examples. Uh, as I said, initially, you can do some uh, uh, pre-processing, uh, clean up your stuff, and uh, uh, remove redundant things, uh, maybe some features you don't want, and all that stuff. And uh, all of the uh, methods uh, inside Python are implemented as classes. So once you've decided which method uh, you want, uh, you can import, you have to import the class, and then you create an object of that class. And this is your chance at this point to uh, set all the hyperparameters for your algorithm. So there's two types of parameters, if you remember. There's the hyperparameters, that's for tuning your algorithm, uh, basically affecting the complexity or degrees of freedom of the algorithm, how many parameters uh, you know it's going to uh, have and things like that. And that's you you tune that with the by setting the hyperparameters of your algorithm. And, uh, and the other set are the actual parameters. The other type of parameters are the actual parameters and that's what gets learned during the training. Uh, so uh, for Number four, the fourth step would be for supervised learning. You need to split the data between um, training and testing. Because remember, in supervised learning, you get an input, you predict an output, and then you want to check how good you've done 
So you you can split the data ahead and take a bit, maybe 25% for uh, testing, see how good you've done. In unsupervised learning, you don't need to do this step because there is no output. Okay, the, you just have the feature matrix by itself. Okay, so you fit your model. This is done with the fit method. This is where the learning, this is where the parameters get learned. And then uh, you predict and check the results. And of course, you can iterate the whole thing to improve your, your model. Okay, we talked last time very quickly about the, the, the most basic example that you find everywhere of uh, machine learning, which is the Fisher iris data. And that's basically, you can load it from Seaborn uh, uh, or you can load it from uh, scikit-learn, uh, both cases, it's, it's available in uh, both packages. So that's basically a set of uh, data measurements. So there's four features. So this is the picture, if you want to see, this is a, an iris. So that's the sepal, the petal. We've got four features uh, per per uh, sample. This is one sample here. That's the input, all right? And the output is the species. So there's three uh, species. Uh, so obviously this is a, a supervised learning classification uh, problem because we, we are basically, uh, we have discrete uh, labels. If uh, if it were a, a regression one, you would have probably a continuous uh, sequence of numbers here. Uh, but this is a classification problem. So uh, you got input, four features, and the output, uh, three possibilities, three different uh, species. Okay. And the idea basically is to try to teach a model to predict correctly the species from the measurements. Okay, so as we said last time, the, the, the most important step basically to do before you attempt to train any model on stuff, you want to uh, convince yourself that the data that's in there uh, can train a model. In other words, that there is a re some type of relationship that a model can learn, okay, and use to predict. So in this case, uh, we have a four-dimensional feature space, okay? As I said, the sepal and petal uh, length and width. So four-dimensional feature space. If you plot your points, so since it's four-dimensional, you won't be able to plot it in four dimensions. So the next best thing to do is to do pair plots. As you can see here, I'm plotting the four here against the four on this axis, the four, the different uh, features against the four, and we look at them two at a time, okay? So this is the next best thing other than, say, uh, visualizing, uh, if you're able. No one, no one can visualize the four-dimensional space. Another possibility we'll talk about later, which is dimensionality reduction. But in this case, what you want to be able to convince yourself of is that there is some kind of relationship between the combination of numerical values of the features and the corresponding label. In other words, there is some kind of pattern that allows you to identify the labels from the numerical values of the features, okay? So here you can see that different labels are more or less segregated in uh, in feature space. So these are projections on a different planes, basically, of feature space. So you can see that you have separation. In other words, there is some kind of correspondence between the actual values in the uh, features and the labels, right? Because, you know, you can see they, they are separate in feature space, the different labels, okay? So most likely then, a model should be able to, um, you know, train, get trained on this data and be able to predict based only on the features to predict, uh, you know, with some success, uh, the labels. Now, if these things were on top of each other, then there's no, no way you're going to train a model, uh, to be able to tell you based on the features, which, which is a correct label because the, the pattern is not there. Okay, is the relationship doesn't exist 
in the data. So it's just basically, it will be random guessing otherwise. Okay, so these are, so just to uh, then practice the workflow is you got, you build your feature matrix. So this features matrix has to be always 2D. So even if your input is a vector, you need to reshape it into a 2D array. Okay, that's what um, um, scikit-learn expects. So you have to always, even if it's a column, you have to uh, recast it as a 2D matrix. So that's the feature matrix. And that's, I just print the shape. And that's your target. Okay, we're doing here the member classification. And as we said, for uh, supervised learning, usually you'd want to do a split. So in sklearn, that's easy because they have a train test split uh, function that will do it for you. So you import train test split, and this is the, you, you know, write, write uh, you know, this gets returned into these um, arrays, x train, x test, or train y test. You provided the, the stuff. I think the default is it, it splits 25%. Uh, testing and 75% uh, training. Now, if there is any interest in the future, we can talk about cross-validation in the sense that, you know, you might say, well, why are you testing on this 25% while not testing? Well, you can do cross-validation by uh, doing this type of uh, splitting automatically. So doing, um, say, 10%, uh, for testing 90% and then choose another 10% and then the remaining 90% for training and then choose another and then take an average over two, you know, so you can get basically uh, a better, uh, you know, uh, returns on your uh, validation, okay? But for now, we'll just do it once, just one uh, split take, uh, this will shuffle them, by the way, you take 25% uh, to check your results and 75, I think that's the default, 75% to train. So this is the train, you can see it's 112 columns and uh, yeah, this is it. And, uh, yeah. Okay, so what we can do here uh, is uh, later I'll show them uh, on this specific iris test, we'll give uh, the poor exam. So this is a material that we didn't go over last time. From here on, it's uh, essentially new. Uh, so given this iris test, and we've done already the split, so let's see uh, if you apply an uh, actual uh, um, machine learning algorithm from scikit-learn on this and see how we do. So the simplest, probably the simplest one is the k-nearest neighbors. Um, also, you could say that the linear models are simple. Maybe the simple linear regression is also as equally as simple as this one. But the simplest model is the k-nearest neighbor. So basically, the way this model works, you specify. Uh, so it, this is what's called an instance-based model. So it actually doesn't learn anything, strictly speaking. It's unusual in, in that sense. It doesn't learn anything. It just stores your data. It stores the, the features matrix and the target. And what it does, if you give it another point and you tell it, okay, neighbors, let's say equal to seven, it takes that point in feature space. It looks at the seven nearest points to that point in that feature space. And it takes the majority vote. So which ones have majority uh, labels? and it chooses that label, okay? So essentially, it just looks into whatever it's stored every time you give it some new test input. Um, you give it, of course, the test input is just four, four features, a sepal and petal uh, length and width. You give it that, it goes into feature space, puts that point in there, and it looks at the n neighbors, in this case, seven, okay? And, and it picks basically the majority of the ones that has the majority uh, um, label in this case. Okay, so uh, choose it here. You can choose neighbors equal to seven. Um, train the model. Okay, model dot fit x train y train. That's the one that we split above into uh, like a seventy five twenty five. 
and then you want to see how you've done. So again, as I said, this is uh, not really fitting in this particular model. It just memorizes your input set. So, and now let's see how, how we do. So if you, we take the test, the X test, which is about 25% uh, uh, and do the predict, as I said, it just takes each point, find the seven nearest neighbors and assigns the labels by majority vote. And if you look at the accuracy score, then uh, the model prediction in here uh, versus the test, which we separated early on, you get the score in this case of about uh, 97. Um, so the scoring here in classification, it just counts basically the number of hits or a number of time you got it wrong. It's simple. In uh, 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 in the reg regression models, there's a different scoring, but in the classification, it's easy. It's basically you count the number of times you got it right, and that's what, what it is here. It's 97%. Uh, okay. There's another facility you can also uh, score, which is just a method uh, for the model, model.score. You can score also this way. Okay, so that's the... Uh, nearest neighbors. Uh, now, uh, I hope you can see uh, in, uh, still my pages. So I'm looking at uh, the scikit-learn uh, site. So my uh, usually preferred place to go to here is the this page, the user guide. If you look here under the supervised learning, okay, so um, nearest neighbors. So you can see the nearest neighbors here. So it's good actually, every time you use something, you can go through some of the documentation. Generally speaking, it's it's okay. I mean, it doesn't go into every single detail, but it's good. Uh, uh, and there's, there's uh, nearest neighbors that count. And there's another version, which is like, a, it takes the stuff within a, within a sphere. Uh, and, it, you know, you can do things like uh, try different uh, ways of measuring the distance um, and you can alter all of this stuff with your hyperparameters. But uh, this is a good place to look at, for instance, if you're interested in learning more about uh, So that's one of the simpler uh, algorithms. Okay. Uh, another classification one, which is also... Uh, fairly simple is uh, Gaussian uh, naive base. Now, uh, if there's interest uh, in the future, we can go over the um, theory behind that. It's just uh, uses basically base theorem to predict, assumes a Gaussian distribution, uses base theorem to predict the outcomes. But this also is kind of special because uh, this algorithm doesn't have any hyperparameters, so there's no tuning. Okay. So in, in that sense, it's good to start with this algorithm if you have a classification problem, because you don't have to worry about fiddling around with the hyperparameters. And it's also good because in case you went ahead and went for a really fancy and sophisticated algorithm with a lot of complexity and you know, spent your time tuning the parameters and then got the best score you can, that one, and then you may come back to that one and find that this one without any hyperparameters does better. Okay, so it, it just it makes more sense to start with the simple ones so you can use it as a reference point as how good can you get with just an algorithm where you don't even have to tune uh, the, the, the hyperparameters. So that's a good um, strategy. Jen. Anyway, same... Um, Data set, the IRS data set. <clears throat> Again, you have to import uh, the class, uh, instantiate uh, into an object, and then uh, fit. Uh, this one does actually does does fitting unlike the the uh, previous uh, nearest neighbor. So, and now you can uh, again uh, predict uh, and then uh, compare. The, the stuff that we split early, which is about 25%, to the stuff uh, that's uh, predicted. Uh, here, you get a similar uh, outcome, okay, 97% uh, 
correct uh, predictions, uh, if you like. And again, you can use instead the, the score method if you prefer. Okay, so those were two um, uh, supervised learning examples, both classification uh, that we uh, what, that we used on the IRS model. Okay, um, unsupervised learning. Okay, so there's two type. If you remember at the top, we said either uh, you do clustering or you reduce your dimension dimension reduction. So we'll do one one of each. So uh, if you remember, we said at the start that what you want to do uh, before you begin is convince yourself that there is some kind of a relationship, uh, correspondence between the values in the features and the corresponding labels before you start uh, training your model, okay? And one way to do this, um, is the spare plots, okay? Generally speaking, you're going to have more than two or three features. So you, you're not gonna be able to visualize the, the points in feature space. So either you do pair plots, which is fine for a small number of dimensions, but if you've got 1000 features, okay? There's no way you're going to do pair plots for 1000 different I mean, it's impossible to visualize all of this. So that's another option here, which is to try to squish the dimensions down to to smaller number that you can then visualize using. Okay, so that's what this one does. It will squish the dimension in this case from four to two. Okay, but in this case you might say that's not a big deal. But if you have um, you know something on hundreds or more uh, features, uh, your feature space, then of course it you need to use something like this. You don't have other option. So the idea is to reduce them, but retain the most important uh, features, okay? Uh, so, so again, you import uh, your class. Uh, we're going to do two, two uh, uh, features here, reduce the two dimensional feature space. Um, and these are the features, okay? So in order to visualize how you know what uh, how how this thing things look like, we'll just add these things to our uh, data frame, the iris data frame. Add the uh, two columns uh, and the series here uh, uh, object. Just add them here, and then we will plot in this two uh, dimensional space and see what it looks like. We know what they look like in the pair of plots, that they're fairly segregated, the, the points corresponding to different labels. So what do they look like if you plot them in this this uh, principal component analysis one and two? These are the two new axes, okay? And so it looks similar in a way. So uh, over there, the blue were pretty separate in feature space, in the four-dimensional feature space over there. Here it's two-dimensional feature space, they're still separate. And these two other uh, species, there's still a bit of overlap, okay? So you can see it, it, it allows you to uh, get the same information, but in a reduced. So this would be a substitute for the four by four pair plots that we were looking at. Um, so you can just look at one essentially and get the same information. Okay, the other type of uh, unsupervised learning is the clustering. So there's dimensional reduction and clustering. So clustering just attempts, just remember this is un unsupervised, so the labels are not taken into account. Just based on the features matrix and the value in it, it tries basically to figure out uh, whether the points break up into different groups, the different samples, okay? not knowing, of course, anything about the labels, just the features. So again, this uh, this algorithm Gaussian mixture model, uh, and all, all of the, you know, a lot of the theory is explained on that uh, page here where with the, okay, so, um, this one somewhere here. Yeah, so this is naive base that we, that we did in, uh, Gaussian mixture should be um, somewhere here. Oh yeah, un unsupervised, yeah. 
So these are the clustering ones. Um, yep, should be anyway. It, it should be uh, you know. anyway. So uh, again, let's see if you can break it into different clusters. Uh, we instantiate the same workflow and uh, fit. Okay, and uh, remember here we're we're not doing any uh, training testing. This is just the whole the whole feature. Uh, of matrix because there's no uh, labels here involved. This is unsupervised. So, and uh, this will break it into groups. You can see Z, uh, we, we chose uh, three. So, uh, labels them zero, one, two. That's what you come up with. Okay. So, the idea now is again, uh, just like before with the dimension and reduction, we wanted to compare and see how well a, a 2D plot did versus those pair plots that we did earlier on. Here also, you can see and compare how well did it guess the three groups, the three clusters that we asked compared to the actual clusters, the ones with the labels. Those are the correct uh, clusters. So again, you can add this to your uh, data frames just for in order to plot. Uh, so we added this where it broke the different uh, points or samples into different clusters, 0, 1, 2. And then we plot. So here, this is cluster 0, cluster 1, cluster 2. Okay, we separated the points 0, 1, 2 into different panels. And at the same time, we overlapped the correct answer, if you like, the colors, the actual species. So if this was 100% accurate, every panel would have only one color, okay? In other words, the clustering algorithm would have had 100% accuracy, okay? This is not quite, but it's pretty good in the sense that uh, only in, in this panel here, you can see there's a bit of mixing. And that's because if you remember at the top, the these two species were not perfectly segregated. The the blue one, the Setosa, were very was very far, in uh, was very isolated. So that's good. These two, there was a bit of overlap. If you remember, uh, all the way at the top here. Here we go. So there was a bit of overlap here between uh, these two. Okay, whereas the blue was perfect. So the clustering algorithm was able to really make a clear cluster out of this one. Here, there was a bit of confusion, but it still, uh, still did uh, pretty well, okay, in the sense that uh, you had here uh, a pretty good uh, grouping. Uh, it, it figured that all the green ones are a cluster and the majority of the orange uh, was a cluster. So this is, again, you can check. So it's it's... In this case, it was pretty successful.